Ryan Reese. This is Live with Ryan Reese. Call now, 1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Even there, even though there is that warning for the uh, for the youth, I think the youth need to be listening to the show. Yeah, I would agree. You know that did kind of scare me, though. Well, I think when they hear that, they want to listen to it even more. Oh, it's one of those things, kind of that reverse psychology. I think it works both ways. I'm surprised but, they haven't pulled you off the air yet. I know. Soon, one day, one day. It's coming. Hey, <laughs> I'm stoked to have you in the studio. We got. Uh... <laughs> oh my god. I'm freaking out right now. He's freaking out. We got Eric Gregson from Tithomy Church in Redlands in with us tonight. Dude, I literally... With my special guest. Hey, tonight. seriously, my mind just went blank. I cannot believe that. Okay. We were just talking to you, and I'm like, what? okay, so how do you pronounce your last name? And then my mind went blank, and I forgot your first name, which I just forgot the first name of Golden inside the studio, which she's been here for years that I've been working with. I would never forget What is name. going on right now? Well, anyway, it's good to have you here. For you guys who are listening... Um, Eric is or was the uh, guitar player in the band Sleeping Giant. I don't know if you've ever heard of Sleeping Giant, but they are heavy. They are considered heavy. a hardcore band, and they are super sick, and they are still on tour, still doing their thing, right? Mm-hmm. With uh, Tommy, and is, yep. there, is everyone still in the band? Or who, who's not in the band at this point? Uh, Tommy and Jeff and Rookie are still in the band. Okay, which one became the cop? The, was the old bassist or the guitars? His wife became a cop, Jr. Yep. Oh, really? Yep. <laughs> I thought he became a cop. Nope. He became a stay-at-home dad. <laughs> oh, okay. So his wife can become a cop. No way. That's So insane. don't say anything bad about him, people. <laughs> that's pretty insane. Well, hey, I'm going to tell you right now. Get the CDs. Uh, Sleeping Giant is insane, and I'm stoked to have you in the studio. And the reason why I invite you on the, to come in is because, um, I don't know how many months ago we met, you actually came out. I was going through a crazy time with um, the pregnancy with my wife. Yeah. And we were pretty much, my wife was on bed rest. And at any point of time, the babies were centimeters from coming out to the world. And they weren't going to be able to even make it if they were to come out at that time. And you heard about it because if we were doing posts online. Yeah. And what's so cool about you, there's many th cool things about you, but you literally called up just like straight up as a friend and said, hey, dude, I want to come meet with you. Yeah. And I had so much going on in my mind that I knew that I knew you wanted to come out to just to hang out and be there, you know, to minister to me. But I didn't really understand the impact that you were going to have on my life. And I can tell you that now because yeah. during that time, it was a very dark place in my life. And um, you showed up and you basically just um, came out to love on me and, and, through that, we went to go get some uh, Mexican food, and you started telling me the story. Yeah. And we're going to hear about this story, but basically you went through a similar situation with you and your wife. Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to hit that story a little bit later on in the, in the show, because I, I want people to know who you are, where you came from, and what you've been through, because there's so many amazing things. As I was thinking about this interview today, you know, we've, we've hung out a lot, but we've never really had, like, this amazing conversation of, like, all the things that you're into. Yeah. So... I want to just go through the whole thing right right from the beginning to, first of all, how you found the Lord and where you're from. Where'd you grow up? Okay. So I, um, when I was younger, I was in, um, went to school in Pomona. I grew up in Chino, Pomona area. Okay. Uh, my parents split when I was young, and my, my dad went to, uh, eventually made it in Norwalk. So it was kind of split between Norwalk and the Inland Empire and Pomona a lot, and, uh, but my mom moved to Redlands in my early teens, and so I, I settled in Redlands uh, there, kind of in the, the heart of San Bernardino County, and grew up there and, uh, you know, I guess like any young kid, got into trouble and some different things happened. And in my late teens, I uh, got into some trouble, and, and uh, a couple of guys came and ministered to me, and I decided to give my life to the Lord and thought it would be a better decision than what I was doing. Yeah, what were you involved with? Uh, just... Gangs. Oh, gangs, uh, yeah. no way. So, uh, you know, at, at the time it was interesting because uh, the punk rockers and a lot of H Hispanic gangs, we would hang out together. Yeah. And so it was kind of like half punk rock, half Hispanic gangs. So it was just a very interesting culture, but which to me was normal, but I realized coming out of that now it's not really normal in other places that punk rockers and Hispanic gangs don't always hang out um, all the time. <laughs> yeah. But it's pretty normal where we were, and so... That just led to some issues and some poor decisions that uh, 
but yeah, were catching up with me. So, so you found God f- f- from some guys that came up and just rapped out with you, and then I know you you got into uh, music. Was was music part of your life at the beginning, or did you get into it later on? Uh, music became really important to me in like my early teens, um, especially punk rock. I was really in- involved in the punk rock scene and uh, and kind of metal and stuff like that. And then mm-hmm. after after I became a Christian, it it kind of morphed more into the hardcore scene. Um, which to me was just a more mature version of punk rock, I guess, yeah. or the next stage. I don't want to say a mature version of punk rock, but kind of the next, the evolution of of punk rock, at least in my own life. Yeah, and, it, and it also the uh, that scene is straight edge as well. Yeah. Um, so in, in the hardcore scene, I got introduced to straight edge, which was uh, a, a great thing for me because I'm um, just wanting to stay away from drugs and alcohol and that whole lifestyle and just seeing it ruin uh, ruin many of my friends' lives and having really a negative effect on the, the culture around me, especially the punk rock culture, uh, the gang culture, and, and just the culture of the Inland Empire. And so um, I was grateful for that. It was a, it was something that... It's like um, a brotherhood. Yeah. And yeah. and to me, you know, being a, uh, like just getting saved, to me it, it lined up with Christian values. Yeah. Um, even though the straight edge scene is, is in no way uh, a Christian scene in many straight edge people are atheists or hate the Lord, but Mm -hmm. just the value of being drug free was, it was good for me. Yeah. And so I grabbed a hold of that and ran with it. So how did this whole sleeping giant thing come to, come to pass? Um, so sleeping giant was interesting. Uh, in my, in my early twenties, I moved to uh, Salt Lake city for a short while to, uh, I needed a job. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, I met Tommy Green, and Tommy Green was just a young punk rock hardcore kid. He was doing some stuff out in Salt Lake, but we just we struck up a friendship. Wait, is he from Salt Lake? Tommy is from Salt Lake. Tommy's from all sorts of places. He's <laughs> lived in the Bay Area. He's lived in St. Louis. Um, but all he, over. <laughs> yeah, he kind of settled in Salt Lake in his teens and early 20s. And so I met Tommy there, and we uh, struck up a friendship. And a few years later, I actually got him to move to Redlands to come down to Southern California. And we were going to do a band together. And while we were kind of planning to do this band, we started a band called Death Star. And, uh, Oh yeah. So wait, you, okay. So that's what that is. Cause I yep. wasn't around back then. Yeah. So you guys did a throwback. Yeah. So we did a throwback. Oh, it's all making Death sense now. Yeah. So we started this band called Death Star, which was a side project band. But there's it. some like black dudes in there too, right? Some like, is there? It's just hood. It's just hood. Okay, just hood got stuff. It. Got it. All right. We, we wanted to be the Wu-Tang of hardcore. You guys look like so. the Wu-Tang of hardcore. But yeah, we, uh, we started this band and um, much to our surprise, it kind of took off. People took interest in it. And so uh, we ended up doing an album and then got picked up by Face Down and kind of did that. And and as soon as that band took off, Tommy had to step out of the band. He had a real young daughter at the time, and he just knew it wasn't going to be a good idea to tour. Right. It was a, He did one small tour with us, and he just realized, like, this is not going to work with his daughter. So he stepped out of the band, and Death Star kept going. And so Tommy started a side project band. Okay, called, wait, hold on. What year is this with Death Star? Oh, shoot. What, what year was that? Uh, 2004. Okay. Yeah, 2004, 2005. So you guys are touring, and then we're just... touring. Uh, to- Tommy stays back. To- Tommy, um, Tommy starts a Bible study in his house that outgrows. Well, him and my brother and our friend Jason Keller, uh, they start a Bible study that's kind of running out of their apartment. Outgrows the apartment. Next thing you know, it like we have a church, and Tommy's pastoring this church. Um, I'm touring around with Death Star, and Tommy starts this side project band called Sleeping Giant. And uh, I, if for those of you who've never heard Sleeping Giant or haven't seen Sleeping Giant or have never seen Tommy minister, Tommy, I believe, is one of the greatest evangelists I've ever seen. He's epic, for sure. He's epic, and he's extremely, extremely passionate about the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it was a Christian band, but I guess kind of different than some other Christian bands is instead of uh, trying to take a, a message and craft it or sculpt it and trying to make Jesus cool or how do we make this appealing for people, Tommy just actually spoke about what he wanted to talk about, which is yeah. Jesus. Yeah, like he's he actually he's he's radically in love with Jesus, and mm-hmm. so it just comes out in his lyrics, comes out in everything he does, and so you get Tommy Green on a stage and give him a microphone. And people just get saved. They just can't help it. There's just yep. something about him and what he does. And so 
So um, passion. That, yeah, passion. I mean, he's just he's radically passionate about Jesus, and it comes out in what he does. And so, Death Star was a Christian band, and we were ministering, but we weren't seeing we weren't seeing the stuff that Tommy was seeing. It was As, like what? What do you mean? In the sense of people giving their lives to the Lord. Oh yeah, no. I just let me jump in here really quick. When I I've seen Sleeping Giant several times since I met you guys, and everywhere we went. And he spoke, people were getting saved yeah. big time. Big time. Big time. Like God has his like hand on him as far as like being a voice yep. to this generation for sure. He's an evangelist for real. Evangelist, yep. So Sleeping Giants maybe going for a year or so and uh and their guitar player left and um I'd been playing guitar for years and they knew it, so they asked me to kind of step in. And so I stepped in with Sleeping Giant and um and it just took off. We um got picked up by a booking agency and a management company and just started getting offering tours. And so we Did just... Did you guys ever get a label or is it just... Yep. Yeah. We were, we were signed to Face Down for our first record. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from then we went to uh, Century Media. So, yeah. You we guys just, were like, it was, I mean, you guys were everywhere. Every music festival, blowing yeah, up. We were, I mean, I would show up the places and this is before I really knew you guys well. And everyone would be like, we're going over here to see Sleeping Giant. Like, it was like, it was like this craze. Yeah, it was... I mean, it was, it was a wild time. It was, it was probably some of those most radical uh, salvations and miracles that I've ever seen um, happen while touring around in Sleeping Giant. Now, for you guys that are listening, this is live with Ryan Reese. I have my friend Eric in studio. And we're talking about Sleeping Giant. Some of you guys probably don't know who Sleeping Giant is. They're, they're a core band, um, hardcore band and it's 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 like a it's 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 like a underground movement you know this that culture and um but it's hardcore it's like like growling and yelling and you know i mean it's it's like i mean because a lot of these listeners they, they they're not playing this stuff on the radio yeah but what's interesting is i mean i know when you guys came to play at our church at calvary chapel diamond bar we, yeah. we took out all the chairs mm -hmm. and we even had like a fence in there like for the pit and the whole thing and i remember a lot of the people were like Whoa, this, this band's crazy. But then you guys were playing that one worship anthem at the end. Yeah. Um, oh, praise and that yeah. song. And, dude, people, like, I had staff employees that were older coming after, like, man, we just felt the Holy Spirit come, man. Just, it was just crazy. And you guys just ended it in this, like, gnarly worship yeah. session. And this is what you did all over the world. Yeah, and everywhere. people were getting saved and miracles. I want, let's talk about just some of the crazy things that were happening. Because there, there could be people that, that are listening that go, Oh yeah, that music sounds like it's from the devil, and you know just because like it's hard riffs and it's you know, yelling and this and that. But I can tell you right now, I've seen more people get saved in front of this band, Sleeping Giant, that music, than I've seen with worship bands and at churches. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. Um, because the, the God was there with you guys. But let's let's talk about some of those crazy stories, those miracle stories. Yeah. So where do we begin? Listen, in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> the, the thing about Sleeping Giant, and I'll just put this context out there so people understand. It's, um, again, the, one of the things about Tommy is he was, he was, he's, he not was, he still is. He's passionately in love with Jesus. Yeah. And so that comes out in his lyrics, that comes out in his stories, that comes out in everything he does. And so even when it came to the music um, of Sleeping Giant, we come from a hardcore scene, and so we like this style of music. It resonates with us. It's something we care about. And the thing about the hardcore scene, one of, one of the values about hardcore and punk rock that we like is that it's um, there's this whole culture about really like speaking your mind with passion. Like if you care about something, you really need to put it out there. Right. You don't craft a message to try to um, like lure people in or or what you or what people think is cool. You speak your mind. Yes. And so we would speak our mind. That was just a value and. And what we'd, what we'd speak about, though, was Jesus. We wouldn't speak about necessarily our, even uh, our hard times or Christian culture. It was just, it was about Jesus. It was about who Jesus is, what he's done, um, what he's done in our lives. And we would sing about that as well. We liked singing about Jesus. We liked singing songs that we could look Jesus in the eyes mm -hmm. and it made sense. And and we realize after a while that that really is kind of the core of worship or praise. A lot of worship songs sing about Christian culture or they sing about our experience in Christianity. But if you actually looked Jesus in the face, you couldn't sing the song to him. 
Like it, it doesn't make sense if you look at him. It's, it's just, it's about a kind of this different experience. And we actually wanted songs that we could, that, um, you know, for lack of a better term, we could partner with the angels in heaven and sing it around his throne, you mm-hmm. know? And so, so those were the, the values that we carried and things we attempted to do with the band. Um, I say that because, you know, the Bible says that God, he's, he's holy and he's enthroned on the praises of his people. He's enthroned on the praises of his people. And so what we would experience was, yeah, it was the Holy Spirit showing up in these, Absolutely. these powerful, powerful ways, um, even when, when we didn't expect it at first. But after we started walking in it, we actually, we actually started believing for it um, in greater measure. And so we started pushing. So we even started uh, reshaping our songs and what we sung, sung about and how we sung about it, um, believing that God actually wants to show up and touch people's lives. And so we would see these crazy signs and wonders and miracles. Um, I remember... Um, being in Houston, and we were on this tour with all secular bands. Actually, one one of the bands that plays before us is actually preaching against the gospel. Is actually like these are like like I guess for lack of a better term, satanic bands, and we're right in the middle, like playing. So it goes, you know, a satanic band, us, and then another like atheist band. Right. And we're in this venue, and we're. Um, we're playing our songs and we go into one of our worship songs that's kind of really loud and heavy, but we're actually singing to Jesus. And, uh, and you can just feel the presence of God and, and it's this great time. We get done, we get off stage, I'm putting my stuff away and this kid comes up to me and he's freaking out and uh, I'm asking him what's going on. And he says, during this song, I saw the throne of God come down on the stage. And I'm like, okay, wow, that's super rad. So like you come, you're Christian. He's like, no, I was an atheist when I came in the like when I came in the doors. And you guys started playing and I saw the throne of God come down over the stage and then God starts speaking to me and telling me all the things I thought was wrong about him. And he basically he gets saved right there on the spot. Mm-hmm. I mean fascinating stuff when you think it's like this this is a kid who I'm not going to be able to argue him out of this experience or out of this faith now. Mhm. Um, we, we would have kids come up to us after shows that would give us their satanic shirts and say I can't wear this anymore. I, I just experienced the, the presence of God. Yeah. Like I cannot wear this. Isn't that crazy? Kids, I mean, and, and sometimes this is this is during you know when Tommy would give altar calls. Sometimes it's just us playing a song, and the presence of God would show up and with with such power and such conviction. You know, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us exactly. of sin. Yeah, it's the whole, yeah. I don't need to stand up and try to convict everyone of sin because I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to do a good job. No. The Holy Spirit does a great job, and so people, when they encounter Him, they just say, "I don't know what this is, but I need this." Yeah, <laughs> dude, you I, know what? I want this <laughs> to to expound on that too. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Like I've seen my dad come out before, and he'll walk up on stage, and God just led him to the Holy. Sp- the worship was going on, and he just came out before he taught the Bible, and he literally just did an altar call, just to, hey you know, some of you guys need to give your life to Jesus right yeah. now, and <laughs> there was no message, nothing. And people just get up and they just give their life to the Lord. It's that Holy Spirit encounter because the Holy Spirit, like you said, it convicts. And that's what we that's what we need the most. And I'm, I'm so glad that we're talking about this stuff because we need the Holy Spirit to show up, especially in this culture. Yeah. We need to pray. And he is holy. Like you said, he is holy. And to reach this world with these kids and the stuff that they're into, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're out in culture. You know what people are struggling with, what they're going through. People need to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit because you could preach so much to people and whatever, but it has to be, it has, the Holy Ghost has to show up. You could give yeah. the, the, the bombest message, and if the Holy Ghost ain't there, it just no, nothing it, happens. it doesn't work. I've, or you could walk up and just be like, hey, you, someone needs to give their life to Jesus right now, and the Holy Spirit's there, and they're like, I don't know what's going on, but I just know I need this. Yes. So yeah. I'm just. <laughs> they, so I believe it. I, I think the the anointing of an evangelist is that he gives people a supernatural yes. He empowers people's hope, and hope is the it's the seedbed of faith. You know, without hope, there is no faith. And so it's a. Uh, um, I, I have a friend that says if you have to argue someone into becoming a Christian, you're going to have to argue with them to remain a Christian. Yeah, you know, if, if we true. have to just argue people into the kingdom, we have to continue like continue to argue with them so that, so that they'd remain in the kingdom. There's something about the Holy. I mean, God does a much better job of pulling people into His presence and into His kingdom than we do. We just get to partner with Him because He's super awesome and rad. Mm-hmm. He's He's the best, mm-hmm. and He's so kind that He would allow us to partner with Him. But that's what we do. We partner with him. 
You know, he's, we're, we're not convincing him to partner with us. The Holy Spirit's doing the work. We're just the, we're the conduit. We're the, we're the UPS driver delivering the package, you the know? Vessel, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome. So, okay, so you had this, this one encounter with this, this kid had this, this, I mean, he pretty much saw a vision. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like, like yeah. When you related to the scriptures, he had a vision. Yeah, and, he had a vision. What does it say? Uh, in the last days, there'll be young, young men will dream dreams and old men will have visions. I mean, you know, I, I've been talking to one of my friends. She's a younger, she, I think she's like 24 and she's been doing a lot of afterglows at, at Calvary Chapel. Um, at the conference center, and it's it's with all these young kids that are in yeah. Bible school, the Bible school center, and they're sitting there having these afterglows, and they're just waiting on God. They're, these these are just new kids. They're walking with God. They don't they don't they're just there. They're showing up, and they're waiting on God. And these kids that never had visions before are having visions, yeah. or they're getting word of knowledge, or what, and they're just showing up. And in the same way, you can't put God in a box and say, "Well, that's only going to happen." at the Bible college, or that's only going to happen in a church. The bottom line, we are the church and wherever we go and God uses us, you know, as the vessels and he pours out his spirit and he shows up brand new people that are not, that are atheists. will could have a vision if God wants them to re wants to reveal that, to reveal himself to them in that way, at that place in a concert venue, thy will be done. I mean, it happened to Paul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. It's true. Greatest conversion in Christianity, you know? Doesn't it doesn't matter? So here, okay. So you have that story, and what else? What are some other cool? I mean, we we would see a lot of uh, I guess supernatural healings, yep. I mean, wild stuff, man. We have a uh, we have at, at the end we started we started videoing some of this stuff because um, you know sometimes just people don't believe you, or sometimes it's that the Bible says in Revelation that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So so. The testimony of Jesus, you know, it, it is the spirit, it is the essence of prophecy. It, it prophesies of what is coming. The test. So when you testify of what of what Jesus is doing, it's actually it can be like a prophetic word, which is why I would share my story with you, which we're going to talk about later, mm -hmm. hoping that it would be almost a prophetic word for your life of like, hey, this happened for me, but I'm believing it, this can happen for you too. I'm believing and for this did. breakthrough, and and, it did. and so we were. We started documenting some of the stuff that happened. I mean, we lit, uh, we have a video of a kid who was who showed up at a show blind in his eye because he was hit in the eye with a uh, with a rock when he was younger. I mean, blind. Yeah. Um, they prayed for him. I was completely healed. Um, full vision. Um, broken arms healed. Uh, we uh, one of the the raddest testimonies we ever saw. We were at the Glass House in Pomona, and a kid broke his arm in the in the mosh pit. I mean, broke his arm. And, and I'm not saying this like, oh, we just assumed he broke his arm. I mean, he came out and the EMT said, your arm is broken. I was there. Yeah, clearly your arm is broken. Mm -hmm. And um, before he went to the hospital, we just asked if we could pray for him. And a bunch of people prayed for him. And his arm was completely healed. Right, I mean, right in front of the EMTs. And there was, there was, there was other Christians around who had never seen that, other Christians who were even skeptical of that, whose minds were blown. Because it, it wasn't just like, oh, hey— um, you know, we're just going to make this up and share it with you later. I mean, people experience this. We would, we would, I mean. But you know what? This isn't like, for even for listeners, this is nothing to be shocked by. I mean, I, no, mean, I, I was reading through Acts today and when, uh, when they were going to the temple in Acts 3 and they see that, that guy that's, that was sitting out in front of the temple, he's a beggar, couldn't yep. walk. And they said, he's like, hey, let me get some money. They're, they're like, wait, hey, man, we don't got no money. Look at us. Silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And the dude picked up his mat and walked. I and, love that And he just story. jumped on the dudes and started hugging them. Yeah. You know? And it's, then they used that as an opportunity to give the gospel out. Yeah, exactly. It's all through the Bible. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, I believe it's, it's supposed to be part of the normal Christian life. It's become ab abnormal. But when we look at Scripture, it's very normal. You know, it's like the Bible says, it's by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes. And he took a beating for us mm -hmm. and healing was was the uh, was the the byproduct of that? You know, he didn't just take a beating for the sake of taking a beating. He didn't have to take a beating to forgive us of sins. The, the the cross did that. You know, he didn't. He took the beating because it's by his stripes that we are healed. It's 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 part of the package that he. It's part of the benefit package that Jesus paid for. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's so gracious in doing that. He didn't have to do that, but he did. And it, I believe it's just it is supposed to be normal. It is supernatural, so that makes it bizarre, but it's not supposed to be weird. It's not supposed to be scary. It's not suppo supposed to be uh, any of these things that people have kind of twisted it or perverted it to be. I just, 
People we get just, scared. Yeah, people just get scared. They don't they don't know what to do when they are out of control because that's the thing. When someone gets healed, it is very obvious that you are not in control. You're not in control of the situation. You cannot control it. It is it is God, it's the Holy Spirit who's in control. And so you really start finding out who's Lord of your life. Mm-hmm. You know? But I, th- I think people need to um we, we have to get uncomfortable. I think a lot of people are too comfortable in their Christian walk and they just get comfortable. And I, when I say comfortable, I mean like I go to church twice a week. I read my Proverbs for the day, you know, in case anyone asks, you know, I got that Proverbs, you know, 15th and I do my devotion and that's that. But they're not like living out the faith. Like, yeah. As you, I mean, even like I just got finished and actually today I just got done finishing reading the whole Bible again. And um, I ended at the, you know, the last uh, Malachi. But um, just when I was going through all the minor prophets, I mean, these guys were having visions and like all kinds of stuff. Like this stuff, stuff is man. like, it's here. But then again, like how many people actually read the whole Bible? <laughs> you know what I mean? How many people really like Christians? You could go to church and you could do a head count. Say how many people have read through the whole Bible once? And there could be a, someone in the church that's like 20 years and never have done you know, it. What, why read it? The pastor's going to read it to us, right? Yeah. Isn't one one chapter, uh, one chapter a week. <laughs> Isn't that the pastor's job to read the Bible to us? That's what I thought. <laughs> Dude, you know what? I, I was having, because um, I'm a really uh, not good reader. You know, I have poor reading levels. So I got the New Living Translation. Yeah. I, I studied through the King James with Chuck Smith. So yep. you, to the original, so you know the Greek words and all that stuff. Yep. But um, I read the New Living because I love the way it sounds. Yeah. And it's easy to read. So I could just I could just fly through that. Yeah. I, so, I actually, I like the New Living. That's what I, that's yeah. what I carry most of the time because I like, I like teaching out of it publicly Me just too. because it's easier I teach for people to kind of retain. Yeah, totally. But I, I study, you study probably out of the new King James or King James yep. and, and then uh, the reading new living, you know, I, I teach out of it a lot. And I literally just got hit up last week where they're like, what do you teach out of? It? I like the way it sounds, but when I'll be teaching through it, like there's this word in John chapter seven where it says uh, time. But in that, that time word is that, the Greek word is like the word that they use for hour. Like his hours not yet come yeah. to go to the cross. So when I'm teaching, I kind of break it down. Like, so look, this is what it means originally, but yep. right here, it's just saying the time. Yeah. So, but it's easy to understand. Yeah. So if that's you and you haven't read your Bible, Hey, go buy new living translation. If you have to, you know, I know a lot of people will say, well, it's not the King James. Well, if you're not motivated to read the King James, at least you're reading through the new living. And, um, do it and just read through it and you get the full counts of the Lord uh, from Genesis, the revelations. It's, it's God's inspired words. It's, it's his breath, the word Jesus Christ became flesh. And this is how your life is transformed. And it's, it's, the, it's the DNA of Jesus Christ. You read it and you will start living out that great commission that he called us to do. And uh, you read, you pray and the signs and wonders will follow. That's just basically the way it goes down. You know, I don't, I don't say go out and search out for the signs and wonders because then you'll be an emotionalist. But um, read, pray, and the signs and wonders, they just happen automatically following you. And I think we have a couple minutes left. When we get back, we're going to talk about this story about you and your wife and, and your kid. But you also have a new CD that just came out. And I don't want to mess up the name, but how do you pronounce this? Tithemi. And what is that? That's your church too. Yep, that's the name of our church, and this this album is Tithemi Worship. It's the uh, it's the worship album that uh, my brothers put together. My brother's this uh, the senior worship leader at uh, Tithemi. He's been leading worship with for us for eleven years now, and this is just kind of the natural um, outpouring, the natural expression of our body. And so, yeah, we uh, actually Brian from Corn was the one who really encouraged us that we needed to record this, and so we cut a live album. And I've heard it, and it's epic. And we have some that we're probably going to, well, yeah, we'll give some out for sure. We'll, we'll do a little call in. You know what? You could actually you can call in now. Actually, I don't even know where the number is in here because they just redid this whole studio. There it is. Call in 888-564-6173. 888-564-6173. And we'll, uh, we'll give out the first five people that call in this new CD. And when we get back from the break, we're going to actually play it. Sounds good. We'll go from there. I think we have a couple of seconds left, so we're just going to go ahead and wait. But, yeah, let me tell you about the studio. Thank you, Calvary Chapel, for redoing your K-Wave studio. It is epic, and I just hope we don't light the place on fire in here tonight because Pastor's Perspective is going to need it come, uh, come Monday. All right, we'll see you guys right after the break.
888-344-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag Live Ryan Reese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, I think I speak for the entire administration when I say whoop de doo We are back in studio with Eric Gregson, and we are going to be playing this uh, the CD that we have in studio. It's from their church called Tithemi, Tithemi, which is the Greek word, and it's their worship CD. And the first song that we're going to play is Renewal. And I have this whole CD. Where can people find this thing, by the way? Uh, they can get it on iTunes. They can get it on Amazon. Any any place where you can get a digital copy. Spell it for them so they could down. T-I-T-H-E-M-I, worship. Tithemi, worship. Download it. And here is Renewal.
Oh, are we on? Here we're we on. are. I guess we're back we're, on we're the back. show. You that, made it. I don't know if that fade out worked too well, did it? No, that was great. I, I, I gave her the signal. You did excellent. I it's don't Ryan. know, man. I think Golden kind of blew it, honestly. No. We're going to have to get a new fader. You asked her <laughs> to follow the signal. She did. She did you did excellent. Job. You deserve a raise. Father, we're just asking for more. More raise for <laughs> Golden, please. Increase, Lord. Increase. Hey, we, we got a cool comment that um, I want to go ahead and grab this before we get into the, uh, the gnarly story here. Okay. This is Tabitha. And oh, it's a, it's a touch screen now. Let me see. Touch Tab- it. Tabitha, are you there? Uh oh. Let me see. They got touch screens up in here. They're doing it. I don't know. Same Let's see. Rolling. I don't know if these, these new uh, touch screens are working too well. It's working. I don't hear. Hello? It. Oh, yeah, there you there are. How are you doing, is. Tabitha? Hey, I'm good. How are you guys? Good, good. Uh, we want to hear the story that you have for Eric tonight. Yeah, so um, when I first kind of got serious about following the Lord, my youth pastor, um, I had kind of listened to some, like, before I was really walking with the Lord, I listened to a bunch of, like, Three Days Grace and, like, all kinds of music that, like, it kind of had a similar vibe, but, like, the lyrics are just totally, like, not of the Lord. And so when I first got started getting serious about the Lord, my youth pastor, she's like, hey, you should check out this band. I'll sleep in giant. I think you'll really like them. And um, the first song I heard was Sons of Thunder. Yeah. And just like the quoting of the scripture in the beginning, and then just like the whole feel of the song was just like it had that that tugging of the heart, which which like I got from like the secular music, but then it also had like the power of the Holy Spirit, and so I was just instantly like hooked on that style of music. And then he started showing me other stuff like For Today and. Like now, hardcore music is such a huge part of my faith, and I've been so influenced by so many of these great bands that just are preaching the gospel and sharing the word. And um, I love talking to people about how, like what the Lord is doing through bands like Sleeping Giant and For Today, yeah, and um, just like Lacey Stern. You know, I just saw her in concert a couple weeks ago, and so I just wanted to say thank you for like what you guys do and like the whosoever movement and everything. It's just had a huge impact on my walk with the Lord. Rad. Dude, that is awesome. You know what? Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for calling in. I, re- I really yeah. appreciate that. Well, you know what? Go ahead and stay on the line. We're going to send you one of these CDs too. Is that cool? Yeah. Awesome. That'd be great. All right. You got the hardcore stuff. Now you're going to get the uh, hardcore worship stuff. Right on. <laughs> All right. Take it easy. Thanks. All right. Let's see. I'm trying these, uh, push screens all right man so the reason why i brought you here tonight we got another 30 minutes i want to hear the story of uh the whole story about you and your wife you know we know that you got married you had some kids yep but then there was a little situation with the second pregnancy yeah so um yeah so my wife and i we've been married for 13 years and we had a we had our, our first uh our first son six years almost almost seven years ago and and uh it was awesome, great, great kid, and I mean, just amazing. He was. We knew we wanted more than one. Uh, we knew we wanted a, another kid, and so, um, so we tried a few years after, and and she got pregnant. Um, this was a little over three years ago now, and everything was fine with the pregnancy. We're moving forward. Everything's great. You know, she's getting her uh, her sonograms, and everything's looking good, and the baby's coming along fine. And and, uh, and one day she goes in to uh, to have a checkup, and and they're checking her out and they say, it looks like we have an issue here. You're, you're going into preterm labor. And, uh, how many months is this or weeks? Um, we were, I think three or four months in. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was bad. And so, um, you know, this, this was just, she was just kind of like the regular doctor. She was in the hospital and they say, you know, uh, we were with, uh, Kaiser at the time. So like, you need to go to the main hospital so they sent her over to Fontana, and they checked her out, and they're like, yeah, like, you're totally starting to dilate. Like, this is really bad. And so they just put her on bed rest right there and started giving her medication, trying to calm her down. And, yeah. and she didn't, you know, there was, she wasn't, uh, um, she, there were no contractions or anything. It, she, she had no idea. And so she ends up on bed rest and, and in the hospital for uh, quite a while, and uh, which was, I mean, Tough, obviously, because she's in the hospital, but really tough because, you know, I'm the senior pastor of a church. Um, I run a business, and then I've got a, a four-year-old boy at the time, and so... You're maxed out. Yeah, so we're just maxed out, and we're trying to figure things out, and then also just stressing, like, man, if this kid's born, this is going to be really, really bad. Um, 
one of the things that happened in in not only in Sleeping Giant but even in our ministry outside of Sleeping Giant with the church is is you know when you see um, when you see miracles when you th- see things like that happen and they start to become normal it starts to set up a kind of a framework in your mind of what's possible um, you actually start believing for God to sh- for God to show up and it's a uh, it's amazing because um, you know, like the Bible says, it's like, you know, faith is being confident in what we hope for. It's one thing just to have hope, but it's another thing when you're confident in that hope. That big, is big difference. Yeah, big difference, huge difference, assurance of the things we don't see, you know. And so once you start experiencing those things, your 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 confidence starts going up and, and really so your faith starts getting turned on. And like the Bible says, it's it's by faith that, you know, the prayer of faith makes the sick person well. It's by faith that the mountain is moved. And so so faith is is really important, and that's amazing until your own family gets hit. You know, it really like kind of your life gets shattered. But even in 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 being hit by that, I honestly, I just believe it's like God is for me. He's not against me. I I um I don't think He wants us to lose the baby. I don't think He wants that for us. And and Christians would argue about that. And I'm sure there's lots of Christians would say, well, if it's in the Lord's will, or maybe He wants to teach you something through it. And He did want to teach me something through it, but it, I don't think it's through death. You know, God doesn't have to kill my baby to teach me something. He's much better than that. He's bigger than that. And so, uh, and so we are just really believing for a miracle. And so, um, luckily, you know, my wife didn't go into. Uh, to full labor, but she was, she was on bed rest for quite a while. She's in the hospital for a while. And, uh, so she was just like laid up in the hospital like for like a couple weeks. The, no, like, like stuck in the hospital for, I think a month and a half or okay. almost, on, almost two months. So up to like five months. To I mean, six a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she was, yeah, she was in there for a while. And then eventually they said like, yeah, you're, you're, you've been in here long enough. You can go home, but you're still on bed rest. So then eventually she's able to come home, but she's on bed rest. That's pretty crazy though, too. Like yeah. actually being in a situation, then them saying, oh, just go ahead and chill. Um, yeah, and like, so um, so we're we're extremely grateful that we've gotten through that situation. Like, okay, like we've we've made it through, and and uh, and they keep she just keeps chugging along, and she's keeping the baby in there, and then eventually it starts getting to the point where like, hey, it's it's time for him to come out, and so we actually set a date. Um, she she sets a date because um, and instead of just uh, you know wanting her water. To break whenever um, she wants to set a date to be induced, and so we set a date to be induced, and uh, and two days before that, um, you know we're asleep and she wakes me up at four in the morning. She says my water broke, so we're we're a day before the day she's supposed to be induced. Her water breaks, wakes me up, so I'm panicking. We grab all our stuff. So it, I've never we I've never experienced a water breaking. Is that like a crazy moment? Like, do you think the kids are coming out at that point? Or the kid? <laughs> well, yeah. So, so for us, because she was because she was hospitalized for preterm labor, that means she's dilated. She had oh. been dilated, and so okay. So, so yeah, it's, it's, a whole it's, it's deal. not like the water's breaking and now she's going to start to dilate. She had been dilated for months. Wow, that's crazy. So water breaks. I'm panicking. I throw her in the car and we're rushing down um, to to the hospital. And our hot, but our, our hospital is about thirty minutes away. Um, 30 minute drive. And as soon as we get on the freeway, she says, I'm not going to make it. Like, there's no way I'm making it to the hospital. It's like a movie. Yep. And so, but there's a hospital that's a little bit closer. Um, but just our insurance was through Kaiser. So that we were trying to go to the Kaiser, but it was like, well, we're getting off. We're going to Loma Linda, you know, Loma Linda's like right there. So <laughs> get off the freeway. We have a couple of friends that work there. We call in, Hey, like we're coming in hot, like this baby's coming. And so get her out of the car in the wheelchair, push her up. And, sh- and it's like, her water broke and you know they're trying to calm her down because usually it's like well when your water breaks you got a little bit and she's like no like my i'm dilated well how do you know i'm diet like how do you know you're dilated i was in pre like i was on bed rest for preterm labor i'm dilated so like oh snap so they rush her up to the uh you know rush her up to the room put her in the bed and literally five minutes later the baby's born like boom um and so baby's born you know, do the whole thing. You know, he's laying on mom, and uh, and he starts turning a little blue. And so they're like, "Oh, we think he's cold." And so, so they take him, they they set him down for a minute, start putting him on this incubator thing, and and for some reason they're like, "Oh, we're gonna take him out of the room." So he's already like, they already cut the umbilical cord there. The whole he's yep. like, "You're holding him." Yep, mom's holding him. He's uh, and he just he starts to turn a little blue, which they assume he's cold. 
And so uh, for some reason, they, they decide they're going to take him out of the room. So as they're, as they're pushing him out of the room, I'm kind of following just to see what's happening. And, and, uh, and as they're pushing him out of the room, a cardiac doctor kind of walks by, asks what's going on. They ask what's going on. They say, oh, he's, he's turning cyanic. He's, you know, he's turning a little blue. And so they're like, oh, I'm going to come with you guys. We're going to check him out. They push him in this other room, take a blood test real fast, and they find out, like, he has the oxygen level in his blood is just, like, plummeting. It's just going down. He has no oxygen in his blood. He's, he's breathing on his own fine. Everything looks fine, but, like, there's, there's no, no oxygen. oxygen in his blood. And so they realize, like— I would have a heart—I mean, dude, your heart's dropping at this yeah, point. Yeah, so what, what, Are you in shock at this point? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of freaking out. I'm yeah. just going, like— but it, luckily we're in a hospital and there's doctors. So I'm like, yeah. they're, they're going to fix it. We, we've been getting, you know, ultrasounds for months now. It, like, we know all the plumbing and everything's there. Like, yeah. he's good. Yeah, and so yeah. maybe it's just a little, that, you know, they're saying, oh, it's fluid in the lungs or something. Right. So they, they start doing a couple tests. And this cardiac doctor just decides, like, I'm going to do a, I want to do a scan real fast. He does a scan and says, um, he has, like, he has transposition of the great arteries. This is a big deal. And which I don't know what he's talking about. And so they kind of wheel him off and, uh, and we don't get to see him for about an hour. And then, um, you know, so me and my wife are now we're like in this other waiting room and uh, family's there. Some friends are there and cardiac officer comes in and says, okay, so I've got some news for you guys. Your son has transposition of the great arteries, which means everything, all the plumbing for his heart is there. But the arteries that go from the lungs to the heart are switched. So instead of taking the, the effort, going from the lungs to the heart, so yeah. so when you breathe in oxygen in, into your lungs and then your lungs like then push that blood into your heart, into mm -hmm. the rest of your body, well, that's switched. And so he's breathing fine. His heart is is beating, but the plumbing switched. So he's so he's not getting oxygen from his lungs. Dude, he's not getting crazy. oxygen from anywhere. Crazy. So I, I, on the spot, they had to do this small surgery where they – you know, stick a little thing up and poke a hole in the side of his in the side of his heart that is coming from the lung and basically leaking oxygenated blood into his um, into the rest of his body. And so they tell us he has to have open heart surgery, like full on open heart surgery. Um, so we're like, you know, this is devastating, right? Yeah. You know, all your friends are there in the room with you, like, so they're all getting ready to celebrate. We're waiting for them to bring the baby in, and it's oh like, gosh. yeah, your baby has to have open heart surgery, and this is like a pretty big deal. Wow. Totally devastating, right? So we we get off of months of bed rest and all this stuff. We think we're in the clear, and now like heart surgery just got gnarlier. Yeah, just got gnarlier, and it's just we're just getting the snot kicked out of us. So you know, week later he has a surgery, um, and the uh, the surgery goes fine. You know, it's everything's good, everything's excellent, and uh, and it's all good, and. But this is like this is where things start getting crazy now. So, in the sense of the testimony and what this story means, so so he has a surgery, he's fine, everything's good, and then so we get back into our Kaiser system and start talking with the doctors over there and the nurses, and they're all kind of freaking out about what happened because they said if he was born here, and this isn't to like dis Kaiser or any any hospital, but they said if he was born here, he probably wouldn't have made it. It's too bizarre of a scenario. Because if ever, you know, they're taking scans of his heart. All the plumbing, everything's there. His lungs are working. Everything's working. It's it's too bizarre that they. By the time they would have found out what had happened, he would have he probably would have died. And not only that, but one of the nurses there at Kaiser, like I think it was six months or a year before, had a baby with the same thing who died. They're telling us stories of like other babies who'd had the same thing that died, um, because it's just so rare. And so what I started and so. Basically, I started putting these pieces together, and, and as we're, like, hearing from medical professionals and, and, and different people that, like, literally the Lord, like, corralled us. Mm -hmm. If it was because she was on bed rest that we knew she was dilated, because we knew she was dilated is part of the reason why she's like, I'm not going to make it to this other hospital. Because we knew, we, because when we got pushed in, she told, she told the, the nurse in the, at the OR or whatever that, like, She's dilated. They rushed her in a room. So the baby was born right then. The baby's born right then. They happen to push him out of the room when the cardiac doctor's walking Perfect by. Perfect God timing. I mean, cr I mean, yeah. like crazy. I mean, down to the second mm -hmm. God timing. Yeah. I mean, f 
uh, amazing. Like literally, like the, the Lord. Uh, the, that's the only way I know how to say it is like He corralled us. Yeah. He taught me something different, something new about the supernatural and, and how He works. Like I've I've seen miracles. I I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen amazing things, and I've seen the, the Lord uh, work in work in my life. But this was this was just on another level because mm-hmm. um, literally He's saved my son's life Mm -hmm. um he he corralled us and so it was it was fascinating and mind-blowing uh being overcome by the goodness of god being overcome by uh, it's like this is and you you almost get this sense of like why us you know Mm -hmm. um but he's good all the time yeah i know when i when i when you told me that story it was just it was crazy because I was in the same, in similar situation, you yeah. know, and, and I know when you told me that, I was just like, you know what, it's, it's going to be cool. God's got me, you know, and now, how, so how's your kid doing now and your, your wife? And yeah, he's, I mean, he's, they, after the surgery, they said he should be, everything should be fine. He should be normal. He should be able to play sports, like all this stuff, and he's just, he's wild. His name's Maverick, and he's, <laughs> he's a wild man. I mean, Is he's, he? <laughs> he's nuts. He's a 100% boy. He's a he's a wild man, and I I I just can't help but think all the time like the Lord has preserved you for a reason. Like you have you have something yeah. you're you're supposed to do. Um, there's a purpose for your life, you know. Um, it it wasn't. I believe God loves me enough that He wouldn't want me to put me through such agony and pain and suffering. I believe He loves all people like that, but I, I believe that there's a, there's there's just a purpose for this little boy's life and something that He's supposed to do. That the world is uh, that He's supposed to, in some way, um, you know, pull the veil back on Jesus a little bit further, so people get a glimpse on who the Lord is and say yes to Him. Yeah, that's that's awesome. No, God, God's going to use him for sure. Well, what, uh, so I know we only have a few minutes left, dude, and I want to thank you for coming on because people need to hear, people need to hear everything that we've been talking about tonight. We've been talking about how, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about going out and, and, and telling people about Jesus and, and <laughs> the other, the other, even the other side is like just showing up and yeah. letting the Holy Spirit just work supernaturally. Yeah. You know, and then even just, uh, as you were saying, you know, as you're in the word prayer, uh, just seeing the signs and wonders happen. Uh, all that stuff, it's all there. Everything we read about in the Bible, it's its all there. And the way you experience it is to have that relationship with the Lord. I, exactly. I was just teaching out of John 7 last week and the part where talk, Jesus tells, you know, whoever's thirsty may come and drink. Anyone who is thirsty may come and drink. So whosoever that is thirsty for relationship with God may come and drink. And then it goes to say, anyone who is thirsty... Um, uh, may come and drink. And, and basically what he's saying is he's saying that you can have that relationship with God, but you got it. Whoever oh, it says, whoever, anyone who believes in me may come and drink. Yeah. So it, you have to believe in Jesus, that he is the son of God. And then you could come and drink or you can come and have that relationship with God. And then he says, I will give you torrents of living water. Or in the, in the, like the, the normal language, it says like living water, like in whatever Bible you read. But then if you look up the original language, it's torrents of living water. And when I look up torrents, the word torrents, it means like violent, rushing. And I started thinking going, okay, so when, when it rains and there's a huge downpour and like torrents of water come through a city, it rips out the cars, it rips out people, houses, it just t- destroys everything in its path. And I started thinking about how the Holy Spirit, when you invite Jesus Christ in your life, he gives you the Holy Spirit and it's torrents of living water. And literally those torrents of the Holy Spirit will come and rip these things out of your life. Yeah. This sin or these things that you hate, it will, it's violent. The Holy Spirit is violent in a sense where like it will rip your porn addiction out and you'll be like, I got to watch porn still. And your body appetites are like your, your body cravings want it. But the Holy Spirit's like, boom, it's gone. Yeah. And then it'll take away your lying, your cheating, your, you know, whatever gods or idols that are in your life in that relationship with God, he will have, tor- the Bible says you have torrents of living water. You will have, and that living water is torrents of the Holy spirit. And what does the Holy spirit do? Because it's holy. It rips out things in your life that are, are unholy. Yeah. And when it does that and you're reading and praying, then the signs and wonders and all these things will happen. And that's for you. It's for me. For the listeners, 
it's all there. And if you think that, you know, your Christian life is a bore, you have to get into a real relationship with God and it's exciting. I would never, you know, wherever you came from and I came from, we came from similar places. I wouldn't ever go back. I'm, I'm mad that I actually wasted that, this much time in my life, wasting time not following God. Walking with Jesus has been the greatest thing that I've ever experienced. It's the most fun I've ever had. It's the most excitement I've ever had. It is, it's literally the greatest thing. It really is life. You know, he, it, he says that he came to give life and life abundantly, and it's true. It's, it, it's, it is not just an afterlife. I mean, that's, that's part of the package, but he right. came to give life now and life abundantly. Walking with the Lord is the greatest thing I've ever, ever experienced. He's created us with, with a purpose, with a calling. He, 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 with every single person out there right now, there's, there's something within you. Like there are, there are many pieces within you that God has placed there on purpose. He put them there for, for there's, there's a, there's a calling upon your life. There's a destiny upon your life. It wasn't an accident. He meant for it to happen. You are to impact the world around you. And there's something about who you are and the way the Lord has designed you that actually is, is, is designed in a way to reveal who God is and that people would see Jesus and say yes to him. Yeah. Well, and like the Bible says too, you're a masterpiece. You really are. But you got to find out what that purpose is. Like you said, everyone has a purpose. You're created for something. But how many, like me and yourself, I mean, I, I wasted 20, 20 uh, 18 years of my life not running or thinking I found the call in life, traveling the world and, you know, being successful at, at my job and whatever. But, uh, dude, I was I was like a, a dead man walking through this earth, not even knowing my 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 destiny or what God had for me. And then all of a sudden you align yourself and it's never too late. Yeah. You align yourself with God. He gets out all the junk in your life, the stuff that's dragging you down. He brings rad people in your life and then he shows you what path to take. The script, the scriptures say, I'll be a lamp to your feet. You know, he is a light. He's the light of the world. He, he's a lamp and he'll show us what path to take. And that path to Christ is narrow and the, the, the road to hell is broad. So you got to choose that path. Well, dude, Amen. thanks for being on here, man. Thanks for having me. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I I'm won't gonna, forget your name next I'm time. I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> All right. Later, guys. <laughs>